Scaling AI apps, this is the topic. Very interested, very hyped for this. And um, let's jump in. Shortly to my person, I'm Engin Diri. I'm working as a custom experience architect here at Pulumi. And I really love everything re regarding cloud transformation, cloud enablement. And of course, CI, CD is also some of my uh, areas I really enjoy and work on this. And that's also one of the reasons I'm working at Pulumi. Um, creating infrastructure, deploying infrastructure is really awesome. There are some of my social handles. So if you want to follow me, feel free, including GitHub. Um, I recently learned that people really follow other persons on GitHub also. So yeah, please drop a follow. And Zach. Hey, everybody. Uh, I'm a developer advocate at Pinecone. I'm super excited to be here and talk to you all about how we think about evolving from Jupyter Notebooks all the way into production. And I'm really excited to share all of the open source goodies that you'll be able to try and use today. Really pleased to be here. Thanks so much. Cool. And you love Go. That's, that's really, really cool. Did you try something in Rust already, or are you still in I Go? haven't gotten to Rust. I, it's, it's on my list. I really am excited to. Um, and you know, yeah, uh, but definitely love Go. Um, do a lot of Next.js these days. Um, yeah, so. Cool, cool. Is, is Rust something like you asked, like uh, CrossFit? Do you CrossFit? Is this also something when you say <laughs> no. you like Rust? <laughs> <I> no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, of course, everything lives from your participation. So feel free to ask any comments. We have Marina in, uh, in the backstage of our uh, webinar here. So she will uh, interrupt us if there's any questions. And yeah, she also... Uh, um, will answer some of the questions. Um, join our Slack channel. We have a Slack channel and yeah, give us feedback as much as possible. That will be awesome. Shortly for Pulumi, it's free. Get started, log into the, uh, the Pulumi console, uh, create an account and, and discover some of the functionalities we are a little bit presenting here. And um, yeah, and yeah. Do your deployments. There is a little uh, surprise also in a talk because there will be there is a pinecone provider for Pulumi also. I will talk about this later. And yeah, join and play around. So quick introduction. I know this is maybe probably you already heard about this. And I will really do this quite quickly to say, okay, what is infrastructure as code? I found this quite useful to understand because we will continue from here and say, probably some people ask themselves, okay, where is the relation between uh, Pulumi infrastructure as code and with AI applications, for example, and now we will come to this and I'll give you a little short introduction here for infrastructure as code. Um, Everything starts independent which cloud provider you're using. Everything starts that you uh, work on. Your, your application needs uh, some, some targets to deploy on, so you definitely need resources to deploy. Um, here in this example, it could be a Kubernetes cluster. Then you need uh, something to store your data. It's not an oil barrel. It looks a little bit like an oil barrel, but it's a, it's a database. And then you start play around, which is completely fine. You 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 log into the console, for example, AWS or Azure, and then you start creating resources, um, adding additional resources to it. So this is something uh, you can do. Sometimes this is also called as the ClickOps approach. Again, uh, there is nothing wrong on this one, and it's actually it's an encouraged way to say, hey, you can start with this. But sooner or later inside a company, things start to grow. So additional teams come into the play and they also need additional infrastructure for their own services and need to create then for them, for their services, a, a Kubernetes cluster and then a database. And now you can already see here some of the points where you hit maybe a, a, a thing like everybody starts to play around using the console. So. I create a, in a Kubernetes cluster and team B, for example, creates a Kubernetes cluster. Is it the same? Is it adhere to any compliance and security rules? Because everybody has a different touch maybe or forget we are all humans. This is all possible that we maybe forget to set a, a special check in during the creation and so on and so on. So 
it can be that uh, we don't have a really aligned infrastructure which looks very similar. So when a person moves from one team to another team, there is a high chance that maybe he discovers an infrastructure which it looks a little bit different. He needs time to onboard. And uh, this is something where we quickly hit the place. And now comes the second point. It's not only one infrastructure because one of the, the, the best practices are, hey, do not run your production and your test environment, for example, on the same infrastructure in the case of, uh, of Kubernetes, for example. You'd say, okay, I would not like to run my dev and prod environment in the same cluster. It could be possible. Again, there are edge cases. There are situations where you say, yeah, maybe it makes sense. But generally, you would say we are now in a time 2024 where people can provision their own cluster. And now you see things become very, very difficult to scale up. So you need for every environment, dev, pre-prod, staging, and so on. You need to create the same infrastructure. Now imagine doing this by, by, by hand, by console, is really something very, very uh, time-consuming and can lead to errors. So. Here's the place where we come. You see, there's the Pulumi icon, where we come to the situation where we say, okay, infrastructure is code. So we can decouple the, the situation from, from creating the infrastructure using the console to, to move to a description language. In our case with Pulumi, you can choose from different programming languages and you can start to define your infrastructure here as code and then just apply this one. And as you can see here now, once you, you described your infrastructure, it's very, very easy to, to, to create additional instances of this infrastructure, additional stages. I mean, uh, I always say like this, uh, my daughter, for example, when the, she was in kindergarten, they did with the potato, they, they carved out a star of the potato. She, she dipped it into the color and she could create 10 times the same star with this uh, potato stem. So this is the same approach. You can say, okay, I have here my blueprint of, a, of an environment, of a, of a deployment structure of, for the infrastructure. And I can just now start to create unlimited um, environments. And here comes also now another trend we will see, or we already saw to end of 2023, 24 starting uh, ephemeral environments. So people becoming more cost sensitive and say, hey, I don't want to run my infrastructure maybe the whole day for everything which is not prod. So now you can say either I will spin up on demand when there's a pull request or I will shut the stuff down when it's not needed or automatically purge it. And then when something comes, I can just reapply it because I have literally the description here in my code and everything here, as you can see, state driven. That means uh, the state of the infrastructure will be stored separately. And then we have also the additional benefit of reconciling the infrastructure and see if there's any drift because you cannot really 100% be sure that nobody clicks on the UI and starts to change anything, but you will quickly find out either automatically cron job, whatever system you implemented. When there is a drift, you get an alert and if you want, you can automatically reconcile this back to the state you described in your code. So this is very good and should be nowadays something to say, okay, I would not try on a large scale um, with one of the first approaches, but say, okay, let's let's jump straight into infrastructure as code. And here you can start using Pulumi. Just give you a, a quick uh, overview about some of the points. And I see that my slides get now changed a little bit. Okay, so first of the points, what I mentioned before is the manual approach. So choose your own adventure. See the topic of the slide. Yes, manual, click ops through wikis, playbooks. And I also put something here in quotes, the one guy, everybody knows there's always one person in the team or in the company who took care of the infrastructure, who knows the infrastructure. And you always refer to this person and say, hey, can you please um, uh, take care, change the infrastructure and so on and so on. So this is the manual approach. Again, nothing wrong on this. Um, it's a valid way to deploy depending on your maturity level. And then we have the next point, the imperative approach, where we say, okay, uh, we have uh, different CLIs or we have bash scripts to create this so-called procedural automation. We can just say, okay, these are the steps we need to do to create 
our infrastructure, we need to be aware of which comes before. So maybe I need to create a resource group before, or create a VNet before I create a subnet and so on. So taking care of this, there are some languages evolved, uh, so some tools evolved like Ansible, which also solved the situation of the Edo potent creation. So I can execute the same com command all the time and I always expect the same outcome, which is also nice because it then decouples a little bit the, what has to be done before and to run run the stuff um, again, so not breaking anything. And now we come to the last point, which is the declarative approach. And here we have um, tools in, in the space uh, like Pulumi, OpenTofu, and so on and so on, where we can declaratively, we can just say now what we want. We don't need to think about how to achieve the state. There was somebody recently gave me also a good example of um, the pizza. So uh, ordering a pizza would be uh, the declarative approach and the imperative approach would be uh, cooking a pizza with all the ingredients and say, okay, I need the dough, I need the tomatoes and so on and so on um, to create the pizza or the declarative. I want a pizza, I order a pizza, I get a pizza. I don't need to take care about all the internals. I just say, I need a pizza. And now I'm hungry because I want also a pizza. Okay, with this cleared... Um, also something about uh, Pulumi and say why build, why using familiar language, programming language makes absolutely sense um, and using Pulumi here. Um, of course, one of the points is depending on your team, it may be that you already use a, a programming language, language for describing your business logic. So you could say, I don't need to switch um, my used uh, domain, I can just stay in. I have already everything set up for TypeScript, for example. I have SonarCube in place. I know where to get my artifacts, maybe an artifactory and so on. My IDE is completely set up. We have a compliance rule. We have guidelines on how to code stuff. So you can just continue with this and uh, there is no need to change. You can really focus on mastering the new for you library so it will be an aws library you just include yes of course you still need to know how to to work with the cloud and what to do this is something yes maybe you work with an architect together or you have some some um, guidelines on this but from the execution part it just feels like a library for you very very cool um, Yes, Pulumi also have a huge uh, ecosystem, so there is no disconnection. You can say, okay, I can work in AWS and at the same time I can, for example, provision my new Relic account or my Datadoc account and so on, and just continue provision an EKS and say, okay, on this EKS, I also want to deploy some Helm charts of the Kubernetes provider, for example, in conjunction with AWS gives you a whole story. That's really cool. We have also some native providers, which gives you a very high uh, coverage of the API. And it's, um, I think, two or three days and you will get um, the functionality when there's a new release on the API side from the cloud provider, it takes you two to three days. And then you get um, the functionality also in our native provider. Reusable infrastructure creators. This is very, very cool because we all go now into the product engineering area where we say, okay, we may already created the perfect deployment for a Kubernetes cluster, for example. So I can now share this. I can share this in the means of my programming language, for example, NPM. I could just create a package and distribute this there. If I even want to go farther because I'm part of a... a product engineering team, I can create now a so-called multi-language component. That's what we call at Pulumi and then generate different SDKs out of it for different programming language. So if your company is a polyglot company, the database people work in Python, uh, the front end people maybe in TypeScript, uh, they can just consume it. So there is less, um, less um, energy need to spend for convince people because for them it feels like, yeah, 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 I don't need to learn anything. I This is something I knew and they can use the SDK. And of course, we have a functionality called the automation API where you can go even further and programmatically call Pulumi. Okay, so what does it all have to do with, uh, AP, uh, with an AI application? Yes, now we can guess it. So these are some uh, some landscapes. Uh, I pulled out, so we see here, for example, the CNCF landscape. We see here the, the landscape for ML applications on the left side. 
and then of course all the stuff what AWS for example offers us and then you can see uh, it's quite complex of all the stuff you need and here you can see having our infrastructure as code tool like Pulumi and the ability to, to abstract most of the stuff and you just need to focus now on, um, on writing the code gives you also very, very much uh, the flexibility and the quickness to deliver your value for your business. And an AI application needs all the stuff also. So just continue creating uh, your deployment using Pulumi in the programming language of your choice. And that's all done very cool so as i mentioned before when you joined our last talk with pinecone in december there was a little uh, teaser um, pinecone as code coming soon so there where is the pulumi native provider for pinecone and yes since this month uh, the pinecone provider is released so you will find it in our Pulumi registry for all the languages Pulumi is supporting, TypeScript, JavaScript, Python, uh, even in YAML, you can use this. Um, and now can programmatically provision Pinecone indexes, which is, which is really, really cool. We also created, on addition during the release, we created also some starter templates. So when you type Pulumi new, you will see uh, when you start to write Pinecone, you will see starter templates for some of the languages and then you get also the index everything set up you just need to continue this is a point to to build on and then you can extend the stuff so creating pulumi new inside your application uh, in your repository if your application a folder dot pulumi for example and then deploying for example the, the 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 starter template here and use this as a base to continue very cool um I just mentioned it's available in several different languages and it's really awesome. I pass to you now, Zach. I think that's fine and uh, people probably wait now for you. So as I said before, I'm Zach. I'm a developer advocate at Pinecone. Super excited to be here today with all of you and to talk about the way that we think of navigating from something working in a Jupyter notebook all the way to getting an actual generative AI application in production. OK, so um, I'm sure a ton of us on the call have worked with Jupyter before if we're doing AI development of any kind. So <clears throat> normally, if I was in person, I'd ask for a big show of hands. Uh, show, Raise your hand if you've used Jupyter Notebooks before or if you happen to like them. Um, in this case, you can feel free to also drop a note in the chat. Um, at Pinecone, we also really, really love Jupyter Notebooks. We're kind of crazy about them. So. We maintain a ton of them in our GitHub examples repository. A lot of people don't know this, but uh, folks use them, uh, customers, prospects, community members. And the feedback that we inevitably get is that these notebooks are excellent for a couple of things, right? They're excellent for learning new concepts quickly. They're excellent for testing out new ideas with minimal setup, right? You just write your code and narrative in the notebook. You don't need to be a developer or have a de dev setup necessarily. It's excellent for sharing code with colleagues in a runnable format. Um, and so, uh, you know, excellent for uh, reproductions of bugs or something that uh, somebody submitted. If you're not familiar, uh, we'll do a quick overview of what it looks like. So here's a, a Jupyter Notebook. You can see that it, this is a showing an example of semantic search powered by Pinecone. But you can see that the notebook combines, you know, actual executable code blocks and narrative te text. And so this is interesting and useful because you can see that in just a few blocks of code, uh, we have something useful printed to the screen, right? So we're, you know, in this case, we're loading a data set that we're going to prepare uh, to do some further work on. Here's an example notebook where we're actually using secrets, right? So now we're using Pinecone API keys. You, if you're familiar with Python, you'll notice that we attempt to get the Pinecone API key from the environment. And then if not available, we default to somebody hard coding it in this uh, notebook, right? So if you're familiar with Google Colab or Kaggle, which are places that you can run notebooks, they have native secrets integrations when you're working with notebooks. But if you don't use those, and if you're working in an open source environment, right, there's always this awkward tension between making the notebook as, as easy to run as possible for somebody that's using it to understand something and ensuring that you don't you know, have a security incident by accidentally committing a, a hard-coded key uh, when you're working in GitHub. right? Um, and then finally, here's an example notebook where we're actually converting a user query, natural ambiguous language, such as which city has the highest population in the world, 
And again, in just a couple blocks, we're getting back something really useful um, that we can see and test and understand if our model is working the exact way we want. So, you know, this is all great, but for those of you who raised your hands or mentioned that you're familiar with notebooks before, what are some of the things that we all know from using them? Like they're just not really ideal for you wouldn't want to try to use them for. Essentially anything that involves going to production, right? Because I think a lot of us here have had the experience of iterating again on a notebook, getting some tricky piece of code or you know, new library or new approach working. And we feel this, this burst of elation, like I'm almost done, this is great. Um, it's followed by this dawning like realization that I'm at, in another way, I'm actually really not close to being done. You know, Jupyter notebooks are excellent for all the reasons that we looked at. You can run them on many different providers. You can run them locally as notebooks or pure Python code. You can't really or don't really want to go to production with them, right? So in this talk, we're going to examine the delta between a working Jupyter notebook that has uh, some kernel of an, app, an AI application working in it and what is actually involved in going all the way to production so that you could deliver customer value. And the example that we've built that we're that's open source and we're going to talk through in this in this talk is essentially performing semantic search at scale. And so we're going to look at this quick demo, it takes a minute. And um, this is the UI that the end user of the reference architecture that we're gonna talk about is presented with. And you're going to see them use the search bar at the top to issue again, ambiguous natural language, you know, human queries and get back uh, results very, very quickly. And I'll talk about how that's working. So if the user enters just the letters AI, for example, that's converted to what we call a query vector, a query embedding sent to Pinecone and immediately we get back what you can see are results that include artificial intelligence. The same is true if you were to search for something random like eco-friendly, you'll get back results that make sense. And so the way this is working is that we have products, fake products stored in a Postgres database, and we are keeping that Postgres database's corpus of data in sync with Pinecone, even though users can edit live this table and these products. So the question that this system, this distributed system that we've built and that we're sharing with you answers is how do you perform semantic search at scale when you need to keep a traditional uh, database like Postgres, you know, in sync with something like Pinecone's vector database. So we're going to talk about how that's possible. So to return to the concept of the delta between Jupyter Notebooks and production, if we imagine that, okay, it's, it's Friday afternoon, I finally got this thing working, um, this proof of concept in Jupyter Notebooks is good to go, you know, the deployment model for Jupyter Notebooks is intentionally simplified so that you can focus on the code and the workflow and the understanding the narrative, right? It, but they're also excellent for tests, et cetera. But in production, we all know that the stakes and, and the demands in terms of traffic and user experience and everything are just much higher, right? So in Google Colab, you know, handling scaling could be a matter of, of forking over your credit card and saying that you want to run your code against a beefier GPU, um, but we're going to need a different strategy in production. Um, same is true for logging. In a notebook, it's super comfortable for all of us to just do print debugging and log something to standard out. But in production, how are we going to manage structured logging, aggregation, metrics, et cetera? Um, what about interactions with our database? In our, in our notebooks, we tend to stub out or mock database interaction, interactions and simplify them. In production, if a critical piece of data changes, especially if we, we have an AI use case, we're probably going to want to know when that data changed so that it could be re-embedded, converted to query, you know, to embeddings again and upserted so that it's updated. And so um, these are some of the issues that begin to plague us. We start to realize we're really not that close to getting to prod. So what about secrets, right? As we saw in that example notebook in Google Colab or Kaggle, we can use their na native secrets integration to secure our, our secrets. What do we do when users are uploading API keys or our system has you know, multiple API keys it's using to contact uh, third-party services? So in addition, since we're building for production, we know that the traffic demands are gonna be higher. We probably wanna split out that monolithic Jupyter notebook architecture into individual microservices. And now we're probably talking about a queue in order to orchestrate the work between them, right? So if you've done any of this type of work before too, you also know that there is no single way of doing these things. There's entire frameworks and books and conventions and conferences and schools of thought, and everyone has an idea about what is solid and what is insane to attempt, right? And so I think as a result of all this, many of us here have this experience as developers working on AI applications, where on the one hand, I made this work in a notebook, I'm, I'm ready to go. And on the other hand, I'm still so far away from being able to deliver any value to customers with this. Um, and so a major component of how we approach this solution, thinking about how to not just solve it for ourselves, but for everybody else, 
uh, was infrastructure as code. And, and, and you know, uh, gave us an excellent overview. This is going to go a little bit deeper into the nitty gritty for infrastructure as code particular to our reference architecture. So in case you're not familiar, I'm going to give you another metaphor. Imagine that you're standing in this vast wilderness as our you know, intrepid explorer here is doing. You need to build a complex camp that has tents and water supplies and uh, bathrooms and command center. Um, if you're using infrastructure as code, then think of the recipe or the blueprint for this camp uh, as like this, this magical recipe you have in this book, uh, this, this recipe book. You can hand that recipe to a master builder such as Pulumi or Terraform and they really take everything from there. They know what API calls to make. They can look into your AWS account and understand what you have provisioned and what you don't have provisioned yet. Um, and so the whole core concept here for IC that's really important to take away is that it's a different paradigm for building applications. You describe with Pulumi everything from infrastructure all the way down to your application layer, Docker builds, logging, et cetera, everything. And then you, after that blueprint is created, you and others are using that same blueprint to conjure up entire environments that are already fully formed, they're perfectly replicated, they're already configured properly, they're tested and working. And, and this is insanely powerful, right? So this is about precision and repeatability. Um, it is not without pitfalls, I, infrastructure as code in general. I'll touch briefly on the, some of the pitfalls I've experienced in the end of this talk, but it is a very powerful tool in the hands of a modern developer, especially when you're working with cloud uh, environments. And so you might say to yourself, okay, I heard that self, that's great, um, but I've never done any infrastructure as code before. How could I possibly get started? Well, this is the great news with this talk, and this is why we're excited to be here today to, to share with you that both Pinecone and Pulumi uh, working together in concert, we've got you covered here. So we, we recently released a, our first production ready example. It is defined and deployable via infrastructure as code with Pulumi. Uh, it's written in TypeScript. And the, the core motivation for us was we keep hearing this feedback from everyone about, okay, the Jupyter Notebooks are excellent for understanding. How do I take it to the next level? How do I actually go to prod? So we thought, wouldn't it be amazing if there was a standardized structure that already existed, which anybody could review, modify, and deploy quickly and easily. You know, wouldn't it be ideal if we just had something that helped us create reproducible environments? And so this is what we've come up with. This is now open source. You can go and um, you can use this today. So we think of the reference architecture as an excellent starting point. It jumps you ahead of the tricky bugs we found, the configuration issues, the testing, the, the deployments and test deployments, right? And gets you to the known good state that we found. So it's completely open source. Anyone can view it, fork it, clone it, modify it, swap out, you know, swap in your company logo and use it to deploy something to prod, uh, that would make us happy. So on the left side, you're seeing just an overview of the repo, but on the right side, we're starting to look at some of the infrastructure as code pieces uh, defined in the index.ts file. So if you've seen TypeScript before, this will look familiar, but you can see we're actually defining AWS resources, you know, within the confines of familiar programming constructs that we're all comfortable with as application developers, which is I found to be incredibly powerful. And this is coming from someone who has a background of you know years and years of Terraform with AWS. So you can see we've got some subnet groups, um, a security group for one of the microservices. And here's the RDS database I was talking about being defined. You can see the attributes which are exposed to the end user. So everything from engine version to how many gigabytes of storage are allocated to the overall instance type that you want to deploy for the RDS database are all defined in here, which means if you look at this and say, this is roughly the system that I want, or it's close enough, but I actually want 60 gigs and I, I want this instance type, you can make those changes with a few characters and run Pulumi up, and you will get that modified version of this reference architecture in your AWS account. Perhaps even more powerfully, you will have those changes now tracked in version control so that your team, your dev team can understand changes to the cloud environments, right? It's, it's bringing the cloud environments under even version control with, with all of the interfaces that we're used to there. So again, that's also incredibly powerful when you're working with a team. And then particularly for this webinar, because uh, because it's all of you, and we were very excited about talking to you today. Yesterday, we, we finished the updates to get both Pinecone serverless in here. So now the reference architecture is using Pinecone serverless, which is an open preview. And then it's using the Pulumi Pinecone provider that Engen and his team built and that he uh, shared with us kindly. So. This is super cool. Uh, it was a lot of fun for me yesterday to go swap in the Pulumi provider because it just allows me to delete so much application logic and just say, create the index and del delete the index. Um, the Pinecone serverless play is also really interesting. 
I think this is now like an ideal time to try this because you no longer need to manage pods or storage up front. You, you don't need to have a very comprehensive understanding of your workload shape or size beforehand. Um, we are also giving $100 in serverless credits to anybody who signs up at app.pinecone.io. So be sure to do that today if you haven't already. If you go to app.pinecone.io and sign up, you will get um, $100 in serverless credits to try this out. Even if you don't do that, we already have a free tier that you can use for this. So um, those updates are in as of yesterday. There is a video course available. So if you the, don't want to use the documentation that's included, which walks you through everything and has screenshots, et cetera, uh, you could also opt for the video course. We do a full deployment end to end. We talk through everything, um, how to destroy it, how to configure a jump host in order to access you know, backend resources. So that's also a resource for you as well. That's linked in the documentation of the repository. So you might be thinking to yourself, like that, that sounds all well and good, but let's say this is interesting to me as a developer, I actually want to try and deploy it some you know, next Saturday. Like, what are you actually asking of me? How much of a lift is this going to be? Well, the first thing is, is great is you don't have to pay us anything because we have the free Pinecone tier. Um, we've also got the $100 in serverless credits for anyone that signs up. And what's involved in doing this is cloning the repository, setting your API key as the instructions you know, uh, explain how to do, in your Pulumi config, and then setting the AWS uh, region that you want to deploy to, you would then run Pulumi up, and then deployment takes about 10 and a half minutes end to end. So we currently think of this as the fastest way to get up and running with a distributed system that uses Pinecone at scale. And that's useful in a bunch of different contexts, not necessarily just getting an app in prod. It's useful as a reference. It's useful as a test harness and test bed. Um, yesterday, we actually published a new blog post that explains how to deploy this reference architecture and then use step-by-step -step, generate arbitrary records and feed them through the system in order to cause additional load, cause the microservices to you know, tip into their auto-scaling modes and, and basically watch the system respond and shuttle millions of messages through and get them into a Pinecone index, right? So in general, we, we think of this as like a very powerful tool um, that anybody can use. We Zach, also think, short, yes, yes. Can please. I ask a short question? I just interrupted Absolutely. you there. Please. Uh, Sunset Ninja, which is an actual really cool uh, username, uh, uh -huh. asked, can you apply usage parameters and load data to real world example for scaling up AI, perhaps this in the notebooks? Um, could you, sorry, could you repeat that once more? Uh, can you apply usage parameters and load data to real world example for scaling up AI? Question mark. I, perhaps I believe this the answer is in the notebooks. You could do that with notebooks. We have, um, so for example, a lot of those notebooks, they load data sets dynamically. And you could either use that data set getting pulled from Hugging Face probably, or you could modify it and say, pull this data, you know, this data set that I've got somewhere on the internet and then work through it that way. I, I believe, and as we'll, we'll kind of get into a little bit more here later in the talk, like the reference architecture would also be an excellent uh, choice because you can deploy it once you understand, okay, I spent 15 minutes, it's deployed. Now I kind of see what it all entails. You could figure out where to make the modification in that index.ts file and say, use my RDS database snapshot that has my data loaded in it, right? So that's the way that we think of this as being most useful for everyone is, you know, use it as a reference, but also deploy it yourself and then say, oh, great. Okay, this is roughly what I want. Now I want to swap in my data set. And then you are significantly closer to having a you know production ready high scale distributed system that can process the data that you need. Um, let me let me know if that answers your question or if not, I'm, we're happy to to dig in more. Okay, um, one last thing I'll mention about this reference architecture: why do we open source it? Well, uh, we are you know committed to making this something that continuously improves. And so to that point, if you look at the repo, you know weeks ago we we merged a couple of excellent contributions from the Pulumi team to make things better, and then just yesterday I was in there update to use Pinecone serverless and to use the native uh, Pulumi Pinecone provider. So, um, and then, you know, community members have already filed some issues and asked for things. And so um, this is something that we plan for it to just continuously improve until it's the most useful baseline that it can be, if you will. So with that in mind, uh, let's take a look at what um, the reference architecture actually comprises with one more short informative, uh, hopefully informative detour on embeddings. So just in case we got all the way here and you're like, what the hell are embeddings? And everyone keeps saying this word and what, what is this uh, guy talking about? Let's do a very brief aside on embeddings, why they're so powerful and particularly why they inform the semantic search use case. So at a high level, embeddings are numerical representations 
that capture the essential features and the relationships of the objects, the data objects that it sees, right? So in as this diagram shows, object one, object two, object three are data. They don't have to be just text. They could be images, videos. Um, they could be you know audio. It goes into an embedding model. There's all types of embedding models. Uh, there's OpenAI's Ada002 you might have seen that's quite popular. There's open source and closed source embedding models. But what they, they tend to do is use something like a neural net under the hood and then extract essential features from the data they've seen. And what comes out are these you know, lists of floating point numbers that we call embeddings or vectors. So why is that so powerful? Why is this important at all? Once we get into the vector database, we've upserted these vectors that describe the data in essential features that it's seen in their relationships. When we get into high dimensional vector space, if you look at this visualization, you start to understand some of the power of this paradigm, right? The, the vectors that are clo uh, less closely grouped together, like these blue dots, these might be, for example, dog and then airplane and Bank of England, right? They're not very similar. So they're, they're, they're further apart in vector space. However, this cluster of yellow um, vectors here, you can see are grouped closely together, not just because they're words of similar length, not just because they are uh, English words, but because they are days of the week. That is an essential feature that describes what these are. And it describes what these are critically, semantically, the way that we as humans understand them. And this is the essence of what makes these you know, systems that use vector databases so powerful because we're not just looking at the relationships between objects, we're actually getting at the underlying semantic meaning when a user issues a natural query, such as products that use AI, right? And a vector database is a piece of technology that allows us to manage those vectors in vector data in high dimensional vector space at scale. So think about MySQL, how that works for data, you know, in a more traditional table-based scheme. It allows us to quickly insert, update, delete them as necessary, and then really powerfully find similar vectors given a query vector. So when I say I want products that use AI that's converted to a query vector sent to Pinecone, and in milliseconds, Pinecone can traverse billions of, of vectors and return just the nearest neighbors that most similarly match uh, my query. And that gets at the semantic meaning of what I was looking for. The final piece to understand what's demonstrated by the system as well is that a vector database like Pinecone allows you to also associate arbitrary metadata. So think of like a JavaScript object with any properties you want with each vector as it's upserted. And this is a very powerful means that we use in this system to link the Postgres ID of the product to the vector you know, embedding of that natural language description. Another way to say that is that that's how we link the user's natural language query and their intent with the structured data in Postgres. But we're using Pinecone first as a, a semantic search layer on top, and we're getting the results instantly, right? So quite powerful. With all that in mind now, with that quick like crash course in embeddings, let's look at this again and just remember that users are entering natural language queries in the search bar. Those are being converted into query vectors. Query vectors go to Pinecone. Pinecone returns the nearest neighbors from the vector database. And those all have metadata associated with them that have the exact Postgres ID. So that once we get back the nearest neighbors, we just select on the Postgres IDs two queries very quickly, and uh, you see that the user gets this responsive experience where they can search over an arbitrary uh, you know, corpus of whatever records you would want. So um, in essence, that's how this works. But the challenge that we had with the system and what you're seeing here is as the user edits something, they can change a product description. That goes back to Postgres, and then uh, we need some way to keep that change in Postgres in sync with Pinecone. And that, at a high level, that's the technical challenge that the system is demonstrating um, how to solve. So now that we have that kind of uh, in the back of our minds, we can look at the actual architecture and understand how this all kind of hangs together. Let's first look, though, at the high-level data flow. Can, can I quickly yes, interrupt you, Zik? Absolutely, okay, just, always. Uh, um, there's a question from Mohamed, uh, and he asks, can be query sensitive data? Uh, define sensitive. PI HIPAA, I would say. So Pinecone itself is HIPAA compliant, SOC 2 compliant, and GDPR compliant, um, I believe. And we have a page up on Pinecone IO that details all of our various security certifications. It, I think it's a bigger question, depending on uh, all the other systems you use, if your entire pipeline um, is going to be compliant with whatever uh, compliance framework you're trying to satisfy. That's a bigger question. The, the database itself in Pinecone's uh, particular instance 
um, is ready for, for those things. Um, so you can, you can use it for that. Uh, there's also a bunch of tricks where um, there's ways to use, you know, like like this similar to this Postgres scheme. You, know, you could store a reference maybe, and not the actual data, um, or just a piece of a description of something if it's sensitive. There's also ways to use namespaces in Pinecone, where you can segregate um, user data or organizational data by namespace, and that is, you know, a sufficient um, segregation mechanism for individual users. So there are there are options there. Um, the the reason it's a little bit harder to answer that question categorically in this call just because if you are building an entire pipeline end to end, as we're contemplating doing here, um, I think it's a bigger question as to is every piece of that stack compliant. And I, I would I would add is actually it will be dependent on the authorization configured to the sensitive data if encryption at place um, and how you store sensitive data. Um, Absolutely, it all depends on that. So. Yeah, but for I can tell you for Pinecone side, um, everything is encrypted in flight, encrypted at rest, um, and so and we do have the certifications up. Which if you Google Pinecone vector database and certifications or SOC two compliant, you'll get the page that lists all of them. So hopefully that helps. But okay, I'm going to quickly return to the high level data flow. We'll look at architecture and we'll just be, just about be ready to wrap and do Q and A. So when you first run Pulumi up and the system comes up. There's initial data set that we've loaded into Postgres via an RDS snapshot that's public. We did that intentionally to give everyone the same starting point and to make it easy so there's no dependencies. You just run Pulumi up and you're off to the races. There's a microservice that does change detection. So it's listening to Postgres for change records that the users are either editing in that live table view or that uh, if you're using this as more of a test harness for high scale systems, um, any records that you insert. And we call that Pelican because it's kind of scooping changed messages and putting them on the queue. This goes, this is the SQS queue, and that mediates work between the second microservice and the back end, which is called EMU for embeds and up upserts. And that uh, upserts directly to the Pinecone index. The front end UI that you saw that exposes the table view is a Next.js app. That's why it has both the UI and the API in it. Um, the API reads from the Postgres database. That's how we get those, those records out, but you know, mediated through Pinecone, as we talked about. But when a user edits a record in the table view, that generates an update via SQL um, that the front end API issues to Postgres. Pelican is then listening for that. So it picks up that change and then flows it up through to the SQS queue. Emu, the embedding and upsert microservice, is constantly reading off that queue, converting these to embeddings and upserting to Pinecone. This is relatively simple, but quite powerful because there are auto scaling policies defined for EMU and for the Pelican microservice. So as the system is up and running in an idle state, as you feed you know, 30 million records into it or whatever uh, amount of test data you're comfortable paying for, uh, then you will start to see the microservices scaling up independently. And um, that's quite powerful because we designed these microservices to be stateless 12 factor apps. And so because they're running in ECS, as Docker containers, it's very easy to just add additional workers in response to system load. So this is a way that you know we hope it's useful. We hope you can deploy it and then steal it and be like, all right, I'm going to change this piece and now I've got my app basically. Um, the the final piece that's important is that when this tra transition is complete between Emu and Pinecone, Pinecone and Postgres are back in sync. And so really, again, the technical question this, the system answers is. How do we do semantic search at scale and keep a Pinecone vector database index in sync with a traditional database at the same time? Let's, I think we're now ready to take a quick look through the architecture. So the red box is the VPC virtual private cloud. Think of it as uh, you know, your own private IP space. In, there's a concept of public and private subnets. The only thing running in the public subnet is the front end ECS microservice. There's a load balancer that exposes that to uh, users. Uh, on the internet, and then everything else is in the back end because we don't want people to be able to directly access or query your Postgres database when it's running on the internet, right? Um, so there, everything is locked down via security groups, et cetera. But in essence, um, the back end microservices listen for changes on Postgres, place the changes on the SQS job queue. Emu is constantly reading jobs off that queue, converting it to embeddings, and reupserting into Pinecone. Let's talk a little bit about. Um, the experience of actually using Pulumi for this and why this was kind of amazing. So again, I've done um, a ton of you know application and infrastructure development in the past, skewing heavily towards Terraform. I had never used Pulumi before. This is the first time I've ever used it for this project. Um, in this one line of code here, you can see we're, we're uh, creating a VPC. 
uh, I'm giving it the name and I'm omitting any of the configuration parameters. I'm comfortable doing that because Pulumi's crosswalk is defining excellent um, same defaults so well that I even get the public private subnets that I need. Um, and so this is just to say that it's, it's quite elegant because with a single line of code, I can get a VPC and then continue building out my application. If you have worked with AWS before, if you've used the VPC API, if you've done gone through the console, et cetera, and various networking scenarios, you understand exactly how complex this can get very quickly with subnetting, et cetera. So um, the level of abstraction and power here is not to be, um, I, I think, you know, taken for granted, essentially. Um, the other major integration that really made my life easier as a developer here was the Docker integration for uh, Pulumi. So each of those microservices, the front end, Pelican and Emu are defined as Docker images for ultimate portability between clouds. Uh, you know, Pulumi natively handles Docker operations. So if you've ever worked on a system like this before or deployed it before, you know there's a huge document that says first build all the Docker images like this with these keys and then push them. All of that goes away because you just run Pulumi up and Pulumi handles the Docker image building, the tagging, the pushing, the authorization to ECR. And on the destruction side, the inverse is true, right? Everything gets torn down cleanly because you can see I have a force delete in the repository code, which means purge even the images that are here. So it is very clean, 10 minutes up, 10 minutes down. Um, and it's just a joy because I do not have to describe or explain anything about the Docker images to my end users. They just need to run Pulumi up. Likewise, with security groups, the most powerful thing you're going to see here is the definition of the relationships between the resources and objects. So we've got a security group for Pelican, load balancer LB security group for the front end that's going to expose that UI, that table to end users. And in the next slide, you see that the ingress, meaning which security groups are allowed to access this front end security group, only LB security group dot ID. This is incredibly powerful because again, as the developer who's gonna run Pulumi up and start using the system, no matter how many times I've torn it down and deployed it in different accounts, I don't need to know the actual ID of the security group. The, the relationships are defined and Pulumi handles everything dynamically under the hood for me. So the developer experience is, is pretty sublime, uh, I can say without exaggeration. And then again, we looked at the database before, but um, I wanted to just quickly touch on the, the export concept. So there are, there are inputs to resources, there's outputs to. When it's deployed, what is the host name of that RDS instance? Because the microservices need to know. They all have an environment variable, the uh, you know, PG host that they're gonna go and look for when they're trying to contact uh, the Postgres database, essentially. So in this next slide, you can see this is an ECS service and task definition inlined. At this environment block array at the bottom, you can see each environment variable is an object, it has a name and a value. And here, Postgres DB name in the middle at, um, or Postgres DB host, excuse me, as a value of DB address. So again, no matter how many times I've applied or destroyed this or had issues or, and used a different account, um, all of this is handled dynamically for me and I don't need to go look up the RDS host name. So a uh, really delightful way to develop and maintain infrastructure as an, in the cloud and even work as a team on it. Um, delightfully too, by running Pulumi up, Pulumi is smart enough to diff or delta only the changes that um, are necessary apply to get my local state in sync with what's in my actual AWS account. This is a screenshot of where I changed a single line for a logging signature in one of the applications that is in the mono repo for the reference architecture. Pulumi was smart enough to figure out, I just need to rebuild the front end image, which means I will need to update the front end service and have a new ECS task, task definition. So it built the Docker image, including my new application code, pushed it, handled off and started a new ECS service. And while I ran Pulumi up and got a coffee. Um, so this is getting at creating tighter iteration and feedback loops in production, which as we know is difficult, right? So uh, again, just a, a really nice quality of life experience for developers. Um, finally, let me wrap it up by saying here is a look now. We've, we've transitioned all the way from the Jupyter Notebook of standard out Python logging to a proper CloudWatch dashboard where we're getting structured logging back from each of the microservices so that we can start to actually query and use filter patterns and understand exactly what's happening, what queries are being issued, are there errors being hit? Um, and so we have total visibility into the system. Uh, the reference architecture also, I don't show it here, but describes and defines some CloudWatch dashboards that'll show you which uh, workers are processing, you know, which, uh, how many uh, records, et cetera. So just, a, you know, one of the benefits is that now we're in a, a production scenario, which means we have production grade tools available to us. 
I, I promised I would I'd just touch very briefly on pitfalls and risks. I don't want to paint infrastructure as code writ large as a silver bullet. Um, there's no free lunch in engineering, as we know. So I have seen these reference architectures or infrastructure as code do very well for teams. I've seen that help them get to a state in production that's better than they would have on their own, especially if they're not you know, cloud native developers with tons of experience. I've also seen it cause real problems for users and for the maintainers and the vendors. And so this slide is our wizened reference architecture oracle, you know, reminding us to be careful that there's no free lunch. One of the early pitfalls you might experience if you're transitioning to IC is that as a developer being dropped straight into a complex IC project can feel uh, overwhelming. Because if you imagine, as I mentioned before, I was changing application code, everything's homed here from Next.js all the way up to the Docker build, all the way up to the infrastructure, right? If you have a bug, you might find yourself spelunking that in reverse from you know, application code, Docker build, IEC code, the, the API of my provider, the SDK version I'm using, the plugins um, might not be, you know. So this piece can feel overwhelming. Um, the second piece is also a problem, which is siloing. There's a tendency for, uh, and then can touch on this, like where that one guy, right? Uh, uh, that one gal. So whoever built the reference architecture tends to be the person that continues to receive reference architecture updates and feature requests, bug reports. The way to handle both of these things, in my experience, is to be very intentional about the way you cross team, uh, cross train your team. So if whoever worked on building the IC project should pair code with folks who didn't and then do feature development together and bug fixes together, get really comfortable deploying and undeploying. And that way you spread the knowledge throughout your team and you, you um, lower the risk of siloing. Um, so the siloing can lead to burnout and then insufficient coverage when someone takes a vacation. All right, that was a lot of information, but with that, I will say thank you all so much for your time and attention. Really appreciate it and hope it was useful and we'll open it up now to any questions. I think we actually have one new question. What does it benefit to using Pinecone plus Postgres versus Postgres plus PG Vector? With PG Vector, I'm able to keep the embeddings in the same table as my human readable text. Yeah. That's a great question. I mean, we we don't um, so we love open source and and Postgres and PG, as you can see and even PG Vector. Um, we don't have anything bad to say about it. Um, I can say though, however, that um, uh, Pinecone was designed from the ground up to be solely a vector database. And so the feedback that that I get personally when I'm talking to folks that have used it in the field uh, are that they love using Redis, PG Vector, etc. But when they hit a certain point of scale and they need a certain level of uh, uptime, reliability, all of that. If they need cross-cloud you know, um, capabilities, then, then Pinecone is really ideal. With the serverless piece now, too, um, I, can, I can share being the maintainer of the RefArc, it was significantly easier, the deployment you know, immediately after migrating to that, because I just stand up the, the index that's fully managed as an API. It's a little bit easier than you know, all the Postgres things. We handle security updates and patches for you on the back end. So I think it's not about which is better i think it's which is like writ large it's which which is better for your use case depending on your scaling requirements depending on where in the world you're trying to run it etc but um in particular when we think about pinecone we think of it as just really designed from the ground up to be extremely performant high scale and as i mentioned even return um, queries that range over billions of vectors in milliseconds what kinds of applications or ai tools can you envision using pinecone and plumia it's an excellent question um Pretty much everything that you find in GitHub IO Pinecone IO examples in the Jupyter Notebooks, um, we have decent examples for. We also have TypeScript applications that show image search, semantic search, recommenders, just like everything that I kind of talked through here with semantic search. So, you know, it's definitely not chatbots. There's in incredible e commerce plays. Uh, we have folks using things, uh, doing incredible things for clinicians with medical data, where they imagine the corpus, the size of the corpus of medical knowledge published on the internet and imagine the majority of that being distilled into a vector database or knowledge base where uh, now a clinician who's busy and is dealing with something that's very complex can ask for instantaneous, you know, distill all of the world's knowledge about this and show me the citations. Um, there, there's just endless, endless possibility, really. Anytime that you need um, millisecond queries that return the semantically uh, relevant results for anything. There is a good question now from Andre Amaya. And he asked, do you know any other emerging technologies influencing AI scaling? What do you think about the role of an AI in the future? What do I personally think? Or um... I think so, yeah. 
Um, I can just, I'll just be transparent and share my own experience, which I've, which I've written about um, online. I've been using, uh, I guess, generative AI tools and developer focused tools for the last year. And I found that it um, significantly increased my enjoyment of just development and even large scale ambitious projects that previously I would have felt like, oh, it's going to take me six months. It's like two and a half months and now it's out and I had fun doing it. I, I am kind of leaning on the side of where it feels like we're heading towards a world where there's a ton of um, AI agents that are autonomous and that we can direct toward performing tasks for us in an intelligent manner. And then for that world, I think it's important to have this rich data layer where almost similarly to the way of like the explosion of REST APIs, you can imagine that anything has an interface that can give out data, like a restaurant might have menus and you know, times, et cetera, that they're available and, and you can just direct um, teams of autonomous agents to accomplish things for you. Um, in terms of the other thing, I, that's a great question. I, I think there's folks on my team that probably are more up on which emerging technologies are also driving this. Um, I might have to think about that piece and get back to you. But my, my personal um, experience of using it for the last year has been largely positive and it's, in, it's increased my productivity and enjoyment of my job. What do you all think on that? Curious to get everyone else's opinions. I know an AI image when I see one. Yes, we had tons of AI images generated in that slideshow. That is very true. That was the work of Dolly 3. Mostly agree with increasing enjoyable development. Yeah, totally. And then it's also easier to make a bigger mess faster too, right? So that's the other side. But I think the tools are improving all the time. Yeah, thanks so much, everyone. I really appreciated um, everyone's time and attention. Thanks for coming. Um, reach out to us. There, Let us know how we make this better in the future. There's just one question from Mohamed. Zain asking any input on Pinecone versus ChromaDB. Do you have any um, insights about the SEC for giving Personally, a short key difference? Um, I don't. I need to. I need to go and get more informed before I say anything there. Um, I'm definitely more experienced with Pinecone. I have not given um, the other a try yet, so I don't want to speak out of turn. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. Then let's let's wrap up. Um, if there's anything still questions, uh, you can find us uh, in the Pulumi Slack. Uh, reach out for Zach. I think you're also available in Slack, so that should be not a problem if you have any Absolutely. questions. And uh, the most important part is, yeah, try, register at PineCon, register at Pulumi, try, give us feedback. Uh, that gives us the chance to evolve and to uh, incorporate your feedback in. And yeah, looking forward. Thanks then so much, everyone. I would say thanks a lot and yeah, see you next time. <laughs>